This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, and to find out how you could volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Minter The Prisoner of Zender by Anthony Hope Chapter 18. The Forcing of the Trap The position wherein I stood does not appear very favourable to thought, yet for the next moment or two I thought profoundly. I had, I told myself, scored one point. Be Rupert Hentzau's errand what it might, and the villainy he was engaged on be what it would. I had scored one point. He was on the other side of the moat from the king and it would be by no fault of mine if ever he set foot on the same side again. I had three left to deal with, two on guard and de Gauté in his bed. Ah, oh, if I had the keys, I would have risked everything and attacked Deschard and Bersonin before their friends could join them. But I was powerless. I must wait till the coming of my friends enticed someone to cross the bridge, someone with keys. And I waited, as it seemed, for half an hour, really for about five minutes, before the next act in the rapid drama began. All was still on the other side. The Duke's room remained inscrutable behind its shutters. The light burnt steadily in Madame de Maubin's window. Then I heard the faintest, faintest sound. It came from behind the door which led to the drawbridge, on the other side of the moat. It but just reached my ear, yet I could not be mistaken as to what it was. It was made by a key being turned very carefully and slowly. Who was turning it? And of what room was it the key? There leapt before my eyes the picture of young Rupert, with the key in one hand, his sword in the other, and an evil smile on his face. But I did not know what door it was, nor on which of his favourite pursuits young Rupert was spending the hours of that night. I was soon to be enlightened, for the next moment, before my friends could be near the chateau door, before Johann the keeper would have thought to nerve himself for his task, there was a sudden crash from the room with the lighted window. It sounded as though someone had flung down a lamp, and the window went dark and black. At the same instant a cry rang out, shrilled in the night, "'Help! Help! Michael, help!' and was followed by a shriek of utter terror. I was tingling in every nerve. I stood on the topmost step, clinging to the threshold of the gate with my right hand, and holding my sword in my left. Suddenly I perceived that the gateway was broader than the bridge. There was a dark corner on the opposite side, where a man could stand. I darted across and stood there. Thus placed, I commanded the path, and no man could pass between the chateau and the old castle till he had tried conclusions with me. There was another shriek. Then a door was flung open and clanged against the wall and I heard the handle of a door savagely twisted. "'Open the door! In God's name! What's the matter?' cried a voice, the voice of Black Michael himself. He was answered by the very words I had written in my letter. "'Help, Michael! Henzau! A fierce oath rang out from the Duke, and with a loud thud he threw himself against the door. At the same moment I heard a window above my head open, and a voice cried, "'What's the matter?' and I heard a man's hasty footsteps. I grasped my sword. If de Gauté came my way, the six would be less by one more. Then I heard the clash of crossed swords, and the tramp of feet, and I cannot tell the thing so quickly as it all happened, for it all seemed to come at once. There was an angry cry from Madame's room, the cry of a wounded man. The window was flung open. Young Rupert stood there, sword in hand. He turned his back, and I saw his body go forward to the lunge. "'Ah, oh, Johann, there's one for you. Come on, Michael!' Johann was there, then, had come to the rescue of the Duke. How would he open the door for me? For I feared that Rupert had slain him. "'Help!' cried the Duke's voice, faint and husky. I heard a step on the stairs above me, and I heard a stir down to my left in the direction of the King's cell. But before anything happened on my side of the moat, I saw five or six men round young Rupert in the embrasure of Madame's window. Three or four times he lunged with incomparable dash and dexterity. For an instant they fell back, leaving a ring round him, 
He leapt onto the parapet of the window, laughing as he leapt and waving his sword in his hand. He was drunk with blood, and he laughed again wildly as he flung himself headlong into the moat. What became of him then? I did not see, for as he leapt, de Gautet's lean face looked out through the door by me, and without a second's hesitation I struck at him with all the strength God had given me, and he fell dead in the doorway without a word or a groan. I dropped on my knees by him. Where were the keys? I found myself muttering, The keys, man, the keys, as though he had been yet alive and could listen. And when I could not find them, I, God forgive me, I believe I struck a dead man's face. At last I had them. There were but three. Seizing the largest, I felt the lock of the door that led to the cell. I fitted in the key. It was right. The lock turned. I drew the door close behind me and locked it as noiselessly as I could putting the key in my pocket. I found myself at the top of a flight of steep stone stairs. An oil lamp burnt dimly in the bracket. I took it down and held it in my hand, and I stood and listened. "'What in the devil can it be?' I heard a voice say. It came from behind a door that faced me at the bottom of the stairs. And another answered, "'Shall we kill him?' I strained to hear the answer and could have sobbed with relief when Deschard's voice came grating and cold. "'Wait a bit. There'll be trouble if we strike too soon.' There was a moment's silence. Then I heard the bolt of the door, cautiously drawn back. Instantly I put out the light I held, replacing the lamp in its bracket. "'It's dark. The lamp's out. Have you a light?' said the other voice, Bersonin's. No doubt they had a light, but they should not use it. It had come to the crisis now and I rushed down the steps and flung myself against the door. Bersonin had unbolted it, and it gave way before me. The Belgian stood there, sword in hand, and Deschard was sitting on a couch at the side of the room. In astonishment at seeing me, Bersonin recoiled. Deschard jumped to his sword. I rushed madly at the Belgian. He gave way before me, and I drove him up against the wall. He was no swordsman, though he fought bravely, and in a moment he lay on the floor before me. I turned. Deschard was not there. Faithful to his orders, he had not risked a fight with me, but had rushed straight to the door of the king's room, opened it and slammed it behind him. Even now he was at his work inside, and surely he would have killed the king, and perhaps me also, had it not been for one devoted man who gave his life for the king. For when I forced the door, the sight I saw was this. The king stood in the corner of the room, broken by his sickness, he could do nothing. His fettered hands moved uselessly up and down, and he was laughing horribly in half-mad delirium. Deschard and the doctor were together in the middle of the room, and the doctor had flung himself on the murderer, pinning his hands to his sides for an instant. Then Deschard wrenched himself free from the feeble grip, and as I entered drove his sword through the hapless man. Then he turned on me, crying, "'At last!' We were sword to sword. By blessed chance, neither he nor Bersonin had been wearing their revolvers. I found them afterward, ready loaded on the mantelpiece of the outer room. It was hard by the door, ready to their hands, but my sudden rush in had cut off access to them. Yes, we were man to man, and we began to fight, silently, sternly, and hard. Yet I remember little of it, save that the man was my match with the sword, nay, and more— for he knew more tricks than I, and that he forced me back against the bars that guarded the entrance to Jacob's ladder, and I saw a smile on his face, and he wounded me in the left arm. No glory do I take for that contest. I believe that the man would have mastered me and slain me, and then done his butcher's work, for he was the most skilful swordsman I have ever met. But even as he pressed me hard, the half-mad, wasted, one creature in the corner leapt high in lunatic mirth, shrieking, "'It's Cousin Rudolph! Cousin Rudolph! I'll help you, Cousin Rudolph!' And catching up a chair in his hands, he could but just lift it from the ground and hold it uselessly before him, he came towards us. Hope came to me. "'Come on!' I cried. "'Come on! Drive it against his legs!' Deschard replied with a savage thrust. He all but had me. "'Come on! Come on, man!' I cried. "'Come and share the fun!' And the king laughed gleefully and came on, pushing his chair before him. With an oath, Deschard skipped back, 
and before I knew what he was doing had turned his sword against the king. He made one fierce cut at the king, and the king, with a piteous cry, dropped where he stood. The stout ruffian turned to face me again, but his own hand had prepared his destruction, for in turning he trod in the pool of blood that flowed from the dead physician. He slipped, he fell, like a dart I was upon him, I caught him by the throat, and before he could recover himself I drove my point through his neck, and with a stifled curse he fell across the body of his victim. Was the king dead? It was my first thought. I rushed to where he lay. Ay, it seemed as if he were dead, for he had a great gash across the forehead, and he lay still in a huddled heap on the floor. I dropped on my knees beside him, and lent my ear down to hear if he breathed. But before I could there was a loud rattle from the outside. I knew the sound. The drawbridge was being pushed out. A moment later it rang home against the wall on my side of the moat. I should be caught in a trap, and the king with me, if he yet lived. He must take his chance to live or die. I took my sword and passed into the outer room. Who was pushing the drawbridge out? My men? If so, all was well. My eye fell on the revolvers, and I seized one, and paused to listen in the doorway of the outer room. To listen, say I? Yes, and to get my breath. And I tore my shirt, and twisted a strip of it round my bleeding arm, and stood listening again. I would have given the world to hear Zapt's voice, for I was faint, spent, and weary, and that wild cat Rupert Hentzow was yet at large in the castle. Yet, because I could better defend the narrow door at the top of the stairs than the wider entrance to the room, I dragged myself up the steps, and stood behind it listening. What was the sound? Again a strange one for the place and the time. An easy, scornful, merry laugh, the laugh of young Rupert Hentzow. I could scarcely believe that a sane man would laugh. Yet the laugh told me that my men had not come, for they must have shot Rupert ere now if they had come and the clock struck half-past two. My God, the door had not been opened. They had gone to the bank. They had not found me. They had gone by now back to Tarlenheim, with the news of the King's death and mine. Well, it would be true before they got there. Was not Rupert laughing in triumph? For a moment I sank unnerved against the door. Then I started up, alert again, for Rupert cried scornfully, "'Well, the bridge is there. Come over it. And in God's name, let's see Black Michael. Keep back, you curse, Michael. Come and fight for her. If it were a three-cornered fight, I might yet bear my part.' I turned the key in the door, and looked out. End of chapter 18